Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of American, American Timelines. Lines. I'm Amy. And I am the most attractive fella in the world. That's Joe. Joe. Okay, I'm not that attractive. All right. So today, we are going to talk about 1982. This is the third episode of the second season. It's too many numbers. The 13th episode overall. Yes, and it's... Of American Timelines. 1982. We're going to cover 1982. We are... Getting going in the 80s here. Yes, and they, it gets crazy. And the 1980s were nuts. And if you, I'm sorry, if you were a young person, like if you were in your 20s and 30s in the 80s, man. I can't believe you're still alive. I, how are you alive? Yeah. I I really, I mean, those of you. All that blow. Yeah, you. everyone did nothing but coke. Yeah. And neon, neon parkas and headbands. Everyone wore headbands and leg warmers. That's and right. Was on, every single person was on coke. I everyone. know. So once again, I looked up the toys, the popular toys. Oh, the toys. Of, I heard there was popular demand for this. Yes. Our listeners are going crazy for the toys. Yes. In 1982, some of the popular toys. The first one was Barbie bubble bath. And this was Barbie um, had a hand shower that really worked and a vanity and a little bubbly bath. And this was for the for actual Barbie, Barbie doll. To, to put be, the Barbie in yeah. the, the bathtub, which um, I thought that was kind of fun. And then there was a Bye Bye Diapers doll who was... Um, you could feed her from her very own bottle. She wets, and then you pull a string and sit her on the potty, and she claps her hands. Okay. And so, she's all excited about going potty. Yeah. But she still wets her pants. Yeah. If you if you don't put her on the potty, she would, yeah. Oh. Which I, I never had a doll that really peed, I don't think. Yeah, our daughter has one. Oh, maybe I did. Maybe that's my old doll. No, it's a new one. That oh, bought, she does? I think. I, I always think that's kind of weird. Um, the Dukes of Santa ha- Claus brought it to her. That son of a bitch. Oh, that could be. The Dukes of Hazard pinball score up to one eleven hundred points by knocking blocks into the tray behind Hazard County Courthouse. I'll have to say that's, that's probably the best pinball there is. But I never get pinball. I, it's just yeah. like I've never played it for more than thirty seconds. Yeah, it's kind of boring. I was like, what's what am I doing here? What's yeah. Um, there's a Fisher Price houseboat. So remember, I Fisher, eat tacos. Fisher Price had. Oh, the Fisher Price houseboat. Uh, I had that. Did you have I, it? I think my mom probably still has it. It was the coolest, best thing ever. It makes it a putt putt sound. I don't remember and that. It had, it had a diving board that you could pull out. Yeah. And ca- the captain and a dog. There were a dining table, two chairs, barbecue grill, oh. two deck loungers, two life preservers, speedboat ties to stern, and it had a retractable diving board. Yeah, we had the retractable diving board, and I yep. remember the, the life preserver or whatever, but all the other pieces I'm sure we were lost. lost or swallowed or whatever. But I always wondered, because we had it for so long. It was mm-hmm. just forever. Because those brothers. Fisher Price toys yeah. were around it's, forever. Yeah. So it was probably just handed down to me, but I always uh, thought it came with weebles or something. No, those are the Fisher Price little characters. They they had like a little yeah. round head and a little wooden body. Oh yeah, that the you could sit in the stuff. People, they're called yeah. people. Little people. We call them just people. Yeah, like Sesame Street. They all Sesame Street yeah. characters. That's Big right. Bird and all that. Grover. And then He-Man action figures were popular. Uh, already? In 1982? In 1982. He-Man and Battle Cat for Masters of the Universe. Really? Already? Yeah. But just He-Man, not all the secondary characters. Yeah, I don't think so. I think it was just him and Battle Cat. I think he was that earlier in the 80s, but we definitely got into He-Man a little bit later. We, yeah. Uh, Ram Man, all those guys, Stratos, Stratos. Mm-hmm. And that was, I think, He-Man was one of the first toys that was a toy first. And then oh, they, really? And then they made a cartoon to sell the toy. Oh. It was just like, like a lot of the other ones were a show or whatever. Mm-hmm. And these figures. Yeah. You know, you like the show. Okay, buy these action figures. That was like a, a, pl- a show was just a ploy to sell the merchandise. To He-Man. Yeah, but it's like, kind of a dumb name, He-Man. Yeah. Yeah. He-Man. Yeah, it's pretty stupid. It, you know, if you think about it. Well, and again, it was like the Superman thing. Like Prince Adam looks exactly like him, except he talks like a nerd mm-hmm. and he wears pink. And mm-hmm. But he's still a giant muscle-bound oaf, <laughs> you know, like named He Man, which yeah. is kind of a homoerotic. Prince, a- Prince Adam, kind and then he's naked when he turns into He Man. He's a little homoerotic. He's tan and he's naked, and he and, he, and, he, and his name is He Man, which is kind of a homoerotic yeah. name. Well, you know, everybody's homophobic back then. That's true. Um, there was the official Pac Man and Frogger tabletop arcade games. Yes, we had some of those. Not Pac Man. I think we had Frogger. Andy was a Frogger nut. My brother. Yeah, you said stupid that stupid giant-headed. No, I'm just kidding. No, he uh, loved Frogger, and he had that 
game. It was. It looks like an arcade. Yeah, it looks like an arcade, thing, game, but, but it's, it's real on the table. And it's yeah. So did it work like yeah. real? Yeah, it was the same game. It was oh. just a miniature version of it. Yeah, I think so. I don't know. Those are the toys of 1982. Those are the only toys, or no other toys. Well, there were, but I just I, you. you I was. I, you. You acted like you didn't like the bit, so I just kind of picked a few. Oh, I didn't mean to give that impression. Oh, okay. Well, you, I, last time you were like, oh, I, I didn't want to do this. Well, I didn't want to just turn it into a toy podcast because, you not? know, there's like a million toy podcasts. There is? Or it's just talking about toys all the time. They do? No. I don't know, maybe. Who knows? They I don't know. My son, about everything. Our son was watching a YouTube video where it's just a guy listing the top 10 of whatever, anything. I know. Here's the top 10 times there was a surprise on a sitcom and this happened yeah. it was just random things and he's watching it's just some guy and the guy was like we have four million subscribers yeah like, why is anybody watching this jackass who could barely talk like i he, know he yeah. didn't speak very well like he was mumbling and uh didn't even have a pretty good so i just i told him to turn it off and i was like you listen to me make a list of the top 10 <laughs> items in this room and i was like that lamp yep. that lamp is a lamp it's got a lampshade it lights up that's number 10 I mean, that's all the guy was saying <laughs> yeah, that's like, all that he much does. about each thing yeah number nine was my shoe and my yep. shoe's here i've stepped in some poop the other day and it smells <laughs> like my foot this is a nice story about my shoe number eight yeah and that's you could just make those videos and yeah kids would watch it 12 year olds would sit there and watch it that's true i think that's crazy so what happened in 1982 well one of the things, the first thing, before we jump into the timeline on All American right. timelines, I have one thing that I couldn't find a date for, but I, I wanted to keep oh, it okay. in. All right. Uh, so it happened sometime in 1982, but I don't yeah. know exactly when the release date of this game was. Oh, okay. This is an Atari game. Yes. Did you know that there was an Atari game based on the band Journey? No. Called Journey Escape? And, uh, no. <laughs> that's pretty funny. This may be the worst video game uh, in history. Actually, the, the company that made it, mm -hmm. they're called Data Age. Uh-huh. Uh, they went under uh, after they made this because I think it was such a failure. Surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. So, in in the um, in the game, you're like you're you help Steve Perry avoid <laughs> avoid groupies, basically. Is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, you got to get the journey members oh my to their bus without getting mobbed by by groupies because everybody was crazy for Steve Perry. But if you think about how Atari looked, I know it was, everything he looked was like Mario. Like, it was like a square. I mean, Mario was good compared to some of the graphics. Yeah. Like if you look, like it was like square. The, the groupies were just hearts with legs. Yeah, uh, and the, and then the like the tour manager would help you. He would help save you, and he was oh like a God. pumpkin. Uh, and then, so you had to help all the band members Did you get see to the this bus, game? And, and, and without uh, the groupies stealing the or the promote or evil promoters stealing yeah. your concert cash. One other thing uh, that happened in '82 that mm -hmm. I'm not sure exact date is um, uh, the first president of Zimbabwe. I know this isn't Zimbabwe in mm -hmm. timelines, mm -hmm. but uh, the first president of Zimbabwe, yeah. uh, Kanan Banana, was his name. Okay, uh, he passed a law in 1982 outlawing jokes about his name. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought okay. that was, uh, that's pretty good. Yeah, I had to keep that in there. Yeah. I couldn't find the date. Was, What's ah, his name? Kanan Banana. Because his name's like banana. Banana. Yeah. Okay. So they they would say all kinds of things about his uh, name. slipping on a banana peel. Yeah. And, like, and uh, he was not a having it somewhere. Yeah, he did not like that. Oh my so god. He, that's he funny. Pass the law. I'm waiting for uh, old DT to do that. No kidding. He will. Give him time. Sad. <laughs> January twenty fourth. The Super Bowl was well, Super Bowl sixteen. The Forty yeah. ers beat the Bengals twenty. The Bengals. I always say Bengals, like Bengals, like, like their Bengals. bracelets. Yeah, Bengals twenty six to twenty one at the Pontiac Silverdome. Joe Montana was an MVP. Have you ever heard of him? Yes, uh, I'm Joe, not an idiot. And uh, the national anthem mm -hmm. was sung by, by... a nineteen eighty two uh, former disco lady. Did I already guess Motown her? In a previous, part? I don't know. Probably Diana Ross. Yep, it was Diana. It Ross. was Diana Ross. Okay. Um, and the halftime show was up with people tribute to Motown. Sweet. Always, up with people. Up with people was every was year. Was all the time. Yeah. Because yeah. up with people is like a, a it was like organization. A, it was like a marching band happy time. I'm not sure. I think it's still around. It's just like a. You think it's still around? Yeah, I looked it up. It's like an organization that celebrates people. Like yeah, up with I people. Mean, I think it's supposed to be like human rights. Yeah. And things. Um, how much do you think the Super Bowl ad was? Two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. Oh. What was no. It? What was it? 324000 Well, I wasn't that far off. I think we were in the 300s last time. No. It was still 200-something, I think. No. I don't remember. Maybe. Who cares? Who cares? Why are we still doing this? I don't know why. This and the Kentucky Derby. We're stuck with those. Well, you keep bringing them up. I know, but I think I keep bringing them up because people tweet and say, Nobody tweeted. Nobody tweeted. Super Bowl ads and the Kentucky Derby. That's in your brain. No, I saw a guy on the street. Nobody. Hey, are you an American time guy? No, that's not happening. And I said, No. All right, what's next? Okay, the, also that broadcast also featured the introduction of the Telestrator to a national audience for the first time. And which is? The Telestrator, you know, on mm -hmm. the TV. 
Oh, you know how you've seen John Madden draw circles oh, and that, circle guys yes. draw a line? This guy's going to go over yeah, here. That's that, what that this is. was the first time in the Super Bowl. Was it like there. dazzling? Do you remember watching that? Being dazzled I, by it? I I don't. I kind of vaguely remember them talking about it being a new thing. Look, I can draw it right on the screen here. Yeah. John Madden's probably the one who's most famous for doing that. Mm-hmm. What just happened to you? You get John Madden, <laughs> the most famous for doing that? Every time I get it. It's like a hiccup, but it's not like a hiccup burp. But it doesn't actually. Maybe if you didn't drink so much beer. Like sometimes I have a hiccup and a burp, and they have sex inside my body. And no, that's not, ha- that's not what happened. <laughs> What's that? It's just bizarre. I'm just nervous. You're gonna, I'm nervous. You're judging me. All right. I'm nervous. Our, I'm nervous. Our fans are. What's next? Upset. January thirtieth, nineteen eighty-two. Yeah. We have a new song. Yeah. That's taken over the charts. Do you remember what was at the end of eighty-one? The John Lennon, right? No, that was eighty. Oh. I think the end of eighty-one. I think it was. I think it was physical, it. but. Okay. Um, January 30th, 1982, we have a new number one that lasts till February 5th. Mm-hmm. Daryl Hall and John Oates. Oh, boy. I can't go for that. Oh, that's an awful song. No can do, I can't go for that. Like, why would somebody say no can do? No can do, I what? can't go for that. Like if no he, can do. No can do. Why would you say that to a girl? Like, he's sing, supposedly singing to a girl about something serious, and he's going to say, no can do. Well, this is, honey, this is where you're wrong, because speaking about the meaning of the lyrics, John Oates has stated that while many listeners may assume oh. the lyrics are about a relationship, yeah. In reality, the song is about the music business. Oh, okay. Well, it's a stupid song. It's it's, it's not being pushed around by big labels, it's managers, and agents are being told what to do. I can't go for that. No can do. All right. What's next? I can't go no, for that. No, no more. Can't go for that. No can do. It's an awful I can't song. Go for that. Stop. That's the greatest song ever. All right. What's next? Can't go for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. What is next? Ain't nobody can go for that. <laughs> all right. Stop. <laughs> I'm gonna start saying no can do all the time. No, don't do it to everyone. Please don't. Um, According to Daryl Hall, during the recording of We Are the World, Michael Jackson approached him and, and admitted to lifting the bass line for Billy Jean from a Hall & Oates song. Oh. I can't go for that. And uh, he, Hall said that he told Jackson, it's no big deal. Everybody does that. Uh, and uh, Van Halen, in fact, did the same thing by lifting the synthesizer used for Kiss on My List for Jump. So according to Daryl Hall, kiss, kiss. everybody else that, that's better than them has ripped them off. Every good song yeah, is stolen from Hall & Oates. Yeah, that's, that's, that's proven. according to him. That's proven. You name a good song, yeah. stolen from Hall & Oates. Okay, yeah. Daryl Hall is a musical genius. Yeah, I guess he he is. is all music. All music is oh Hall. God. And I had an Oates collage. Know. February 6th, a number new, another new number one. Yes. Hall & Oates get destroyed off the charts. Yep. They get thrown over the top rope by the Jay Giles band. Is it Angel in the Centerfold? Centerfold. Centerfold is the name. <laughs> My blood run go. My memory has just been sold. Angel in the Centerfold. Angel in the Centerfold. The song's about a man who's shocked to discover that his high school crush appeared in a centerfold spread for an unspecified men's magazine. Yes. The guy in the song is torn between disappointment due to her loss of innocence and his lust. And his boner. And his boner. February 8th on TV, there was a MASH episode. Yeah. Featuring Lawrence Fishburne. Really? Yeah, he was on MASH. I didn't know he was on um, MASH. In, in this, epi- this specific episode, uh, uh, while Winchester fearfully avoids getting his agonizing toothache treated, mm-hmm. the other surgeons discover a racist commander is sending his African-American soldiers disproportionately into dangerous duty. Wow. I think that's where Larry Fishburne comes in. and like He's been around for a long time, huh? Yeah. He looked very young in the picture. I guess so. so. Well, and he was in... Pee Wee's Playhouse later in the 80s, right? Yeah, remember that? Yeah, he was yeah. great. Yep, he sure was. And he also was um, Morbius in the Matrix. Right. Oh, was that Samuel L. Jackson? No. Okay. That's racist. No, it's not. You're racist. <laughs> it's not racist. I just couldn't remember who was in it. It's, it's not racist to get confused between those two. Oh, it is. They're completely different people. I understand that, but I couldn't remember who was in the Matrix. I you saw are, it once a long time ago. You're just as racist as Andy for thinking why Clef Sean was Will you I You are am. racist. No. You are the racist. No. Larry Lawrence Fishburne and Samuel L. Jackson couldn't be more opposite. That's not true. A lot you of see Samuel L. Jackson being Cowboy Curtis? Yes. Cowboy Curtis, motherfucker. All right. What's next? God. Quit I'm, calling me a racist. What's next? Uh, February 19th. While wearing his future wife, Sharon's dress, Ozzy Osbourne drunkenly urinated on a cenotaph erected in honor of those who died at the Alamo in Texas. He was arrested and subsequently, <laughs> subsequently banned from the city of San Antonio for 10 years. Oh, boy. Uh, yep. He was wearing his girlfriend's dress. I, I peed on the Alamo. Was peed from on urinating the Alamo. on the Alamo. Yeah. In a dress. Yep. February 24th. The Grammy Awards were hosted by Quincy Jones. Okay. John Lennon, Yoko Ono, Double Fantasy won big, and so did Betty Davis Eyes. Yes. Um, and we skipped, people might have noticed those Grammy lovers that are only listening to hear about the yes. Grammys from the 80s. We skipped it. Uh, we skipped it last last week, mm-hmm. uh, last year, yep. for the 1981 episode, and I looked it up just to see what did I miss. Mm-hmm. And it was hosted by uh, B.B. King. Okay. Which I can't believe because, I mean, of course, that was 81, so B.B. Yeah. King was way younger when I met B.B. King. Yeah, he was ancient. He, he was like 2016. It was right before he died. Like, he was out to lunch. Yeah. <laughs> he sang, he sang, he played um, You Are My Sunshine mm-hmm. for 
25 minutes oh my straight, God. like without finishing Poor a song. guy. And he just kept like talking during it. And oh, uh, yeah, it was sad. Uh, he was a very nice guy though. Um, uh, March 5th, mm-hmm. 1982. Um, yeah, that's terrible. March 5th, we have a actor death. Okay. Arriving for a scheduled workout. John Belushi's trainer, Bill Wallace, found him oh. dead in Bungalow 3 at the Chateau Marmont Hotel on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. Oh. He was 33 years old. How young? 33. The cause of death was a combined drug intoxication involving cocaine and heroin, yeah, which is called a drug a combination known as a speedball. Speed in the early morning hours of the day of his death, he was visited separately by friends Robin Williams and Robert De Niro, as well as Catherine Evelyn Smith. His death was investigated by forensic pathologist Michael Baden, among others, and while the findings were disputed, it was officially ruled a drug-related accident. Okay. Two months later, Smith admitted in an interview with the National Enquirer that she had been with Belushi the night of his death and had given him the fatal speedball shot. Oh. The case was reopened. Smith was extradited from Ontario, Canada, arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Wow. A plea bargain reduced the charge to involuntary manslaughter, and she served 15 months in prison. Did she? Yeah. Who was this? Uh, what was her name? Catherine Evelyn Smith. Oh, I don't know who she is. Yeah, I didn't know that name. I thought maybe you no. you knew it, and I didn't. No, I didn't. His gravestone says he gave us laughter. Oh, he did. Yep. But March nineteenth, the death of Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes played his last show on Thursday, March eighteenth, nineteen eighty two, at the Knoxville Civic Coliseum. Coliseum. Mm-hmm. The next day, the band was heading to a festival in Orlando, Florida. Osborne recalls his final conversation with Rhodes that night on the bus involved the guitarist admonishing him over his heavy drinking. The last thing Rhodes said to him that night was, you'll kill yourself, you know, one of these days. Mm. After driving much of the night, they stopped in Leesburg, Florida to fix fix a malfunctioning air conditioning unit on the bus while Osborne remained asleep. On the property, there was an airstrip with small helicopters and planes. Without permission, tour bus driver and private pilot Andrew Acock mm-hmm. took a single-engine Beechcraft F-35 plane registered to a Mike Parton. So you stole it? He just stole it. Oh. On the, on the first flight, Acock took keyboardist Don Airy and tour manager Jake Duncan. He then landed, and a second flight took to the air with Rhodes and makeup artist Rachel Youngblood aboard. During the second flight, attempts were made to buzz the tour bus to screw oh with, my to, God. to mess with Ozzy. Jeez. Uh, Acock succeeded in making two close passes but botched the third attempt. At approximately 10 a.m., after being in the air for approximately five minutes, one of the plane's wings clipped the top of the tour bus, breaking the wing into two parts and sending the plane spiraling out of control. Oh, my God. The initial impact with the bus caused Rhodes and Youngblood's heads to crash through the plane's oh. windshield. The plane then severed the top of a pine tree and crashed into the garage of a nearby mansion. Bursting, oh, bursting into flames. Boy, that was a way to wake up. <laughs> Keyboardist Don Airy was the only member of the band to witness the crash because the rest were asleep in the bus. Rhodes was killed instantly, as were Acock and Youngblood. So well, nobody woke up when the plane clipped the bus? Oh, yeah, they did. Yeah. But they just didn't see the crash? No, they didn't. You know, it ha- that's what woke them up. So by the time oh. they woke up, it was already done. Yeah. All three bodies were burned beyond recognition. Oh, my Rhodes God. was identified by dental records and personal jewelry. According to Sharon Osborne, who was asleep in the bus and awoken by the crash, they were all in bits. It was just body parts everywhere. Jeez. Uh, yeah, there it's you go. crazy. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that crazy is. death. Randy Rhodes. Oh my god, that is nuts. It is fucking crazy, huh? March nineteenth. Also, the, the same time that happened was the same day as the release of Porky's. Oh, <laughs> coincidentally, Porky's, the greatest movie of all time. The worst movie of all time, I would say. I think that movie was basically made for little kids to walk in and uh, have their yeah. head, heads covered. I think I, I think. Uh, well, that I remember the movie poster yeah, to yep. this day. It was like a, a shower wall mm-hmm. and a woman's leg, and then there was somebody's eye peeking yep. through. They watched the girls mm-hmm. in the shower. Um, we went to see. My parents took us to the drive-in. I knew you were going to say drive-in because that's <laughs> yeah, the only time the we would get to see porkies. anything that was not for kids. Like I saw yeah. Cheech and Chong's up in smoke when I was like seven at yeah. the drive-in after Grease or something. Yeah, like we the kids would watch a movie. The kids go to sleep. They're supposed to go to sleep. Theoretically, in the car. yeah. And then, yeah, I remember waking up and looking at the screen and seeing boobs. Really. And, uh, and like all the, the showers and all the girls in the shower mm-hmm. and my dad just like laughing and my mom like freaking out and covered my eyes. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> That's terrible. And, but you know what? I've loved boobs ever since. Well, that did it. That did it. Porkies. Thank you, Porkies, for making <laughs> me a man. <laughs> oh my God. March 20th, a new number one single takes over the Billboard charts. Okay. Joan Jett and the Black Hearts. I love rock and That's roll. That's correct. Put another dime in your jukebox, baby. Uh, the, you know who originally sang that song? No. The Arrows? Don't know them. Joan Jett saw the Arrows perform that on their weekly UK television series when she was touring England with the Runaways in 1976. March 24th, mm-hmm. the Oscars. Johnny Carson hosted the Oscars. Best picture was Chariots of Fire. Uh, it was a boring all, movie. I never saw it. I, I just know the song. I remember seeing it. It was and boring. The, it, it, I used to play this song on the cello. Did you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I used to play it on the cello. I have an interest, a very interesting tidbit about that song later. Um, but that won most awards too, and Raiders of the Lost Ark also won four awards. Yeah. 
Um, April 10th. I can't believe we played the cello. Uh, <laughs> April 10th. Uh, Larry the Lobster. You know what this is? No. You don't know about the Larry the Lobster ordeal? Larry the Lobster's on SpongeBob. Yeah, and that's based on this. Oh, it is? Who's Larry the Lobster? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? Is it? Mr. Is he Lobster Boy? Was it? Larry the Lobster, was he a, was he a carny? No. Okay, I'm thinking no. of something different. Larry the Lobster, who is he on SpongeBob? He's the lobster, he's a light lifeguard. Is oh, the big giant? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah okay. with the muscles. That's where they got the name from yeah. this. Larry the Lobster was a subject of an April 10th, 1982 comedy routine by Eddie Murphy on Saturday Night Live. Oh. Um, this is the, a very one of the earliest examples of interactive television. Uh, Murphy held Larry, a live lobster, aloft and declared that the show's audience would determine whether he lived or died that night. Oh, my God. Um, Poor thing. He, Murphy then read two 900 phone numbers, one for those who wanted to spare Larry and another for those who wanted to see him cooked. Call, calls cost 50 cents each. Murphy tended to read the number to save Larry very quickly as opposed to his giving the number to cook Larry very slowly. It's oh, like a joke. Like yeah. He wanted to eat him yeah. and very clearly. Um, updates on the voting were given by other cast members over the course of the episode. Mm-hmm. And in the span of 30 minutes, viewers made nearly 500,000 calls, sending phone traffic soaring. They would save him. Though the phone network survived the spike, it was sufficiently threatening to operations that AT&T established communication with the television network so that they could be warned of potentially disruptive future events. This system remains in use to this day. Okay. Larry was initially spared by about 12,000 votes. 239,096 callers voted to save him, and 227,452 voted for him to be boiled. Um, and I guess I cut this off, but then Eddie Murphy ate him like two weeks later. Or oh, something. no. Like, yeah. yeah. So, poor yeah. Larry. Poor Larry the Lobster. Yeah, people boil them alive. Yes. Poor animal. Like, that's the one animal we don't give a shit about. Uh, yeah. It but I guess weird. it did have a lot of people up in arms, people treatment of animals and stuff. April 12th, the MPAA uh-huh. tried to outlaw VCRs. What? Yep. Unsuccessfully. Why? The motion picture because they they were thinking it was going to stop. Oh, it was gonna, everybody was going to just record. Yeah, movies nobody was going to go to the movies and anymore. Go to movies and it's like a blank, Napster blank thing or something. Yeah. yeah, but little they know it, like you know, people make tons of money from them. Yes, May first, sports. Gato del Sol won the Kentucky Derby. Okay. Gato del Sol. Uh, thank you for not. Making I didn't me even guess try it. to make you guess. Thank you. In fact. I did. I got a lot of research on Gato del Sol. Um, he was a gray horse, yeah. foaled at Stone F- Stone Farm in Paris, Kentucky. He was sired by the Chilean horse Cougar, who enjoyed his greatest success in North America and was inducted to the U.S. Racing Hall of Fame. I don't give a shit about anything about the Kentucky Derby. I'm sorry. What about the hats that people wear? Your mom loves the Kentucky Derby. I don't care for. I just don't. Who cares? I don't care. You come. Al- you come from a long line of people who have loved. The, like your grandparents have tattoos. No, of they their did not. Horses on Nobody their backs. did that. May eighth. Mm-hmm. Another song's new billboard number okay. one, Chariots of Fire, that we talked about. Oh, right. And I gave you a little preview that I'm going to tell you something about this song. Okay. It is a ripoff, is what it is. Oh. Um, it ripped off uh, uh, Vangelis, the guy who uh, wrote Chariots of Fire. Yes. Was accused of plagiarizing Chariots of Fire from a piece by fellow Greek composer Stavros Logaridis oh, called City, City of Violets. And you can go right now. Yeah. Stop. Whatever you're doing, people that are listening, if you're in a car, yeah. pull over, Yeah. get out of your car, and grab your device, and look up on YouTube, City of Violets. Is it the same song? It's No, it's a little different, but it's definitely, it's definitely, definitely a rip-off. Yeah. yeah, definitely yeah. rip-off. Yeah. Uh, so now you know. Because uh, the all you those know, Chariots of Fire lovers out there. All you Chariots of Fire lovers that always do yeah. that. Like, there's people that try to pretend to slow motion run and all that. Like yeah. The most famous time that song is used is... Uh, National Lampoon's Vacation when they're running right. to Wally World. That's right. <laughs> uh, uh, that's the greatest. Um, but this was number one on the charts. Like it was on the radio and everything. I think it's so weird. It's From like May a 8th to May 14th. Classical, it's like a week. It's a classical music <laughs> song. <laughs> like there's no words to it. No, not at all. And the guy fucking stole it. I can't believe that was on the radio. It, was on, it wasn't on pop stations, was it? It was number one billboard chart in the U.S. from May nineteenth, May 8th, 1932 to May 14th. There only were pop charts then. There weren't other, I mean, the stations. I just think there weren't any other stations that played music. I, I mean, just think that would be weird to play. Here's Journey, and then here comes Chariots of Fire. It was 1982. Everybody was on Coke. That's true. <laughs> nobody <laughs> everybody nobody knew what they were doing. Spiky hair, Coke, yep. coked up and on earrings. Lots of blue eyeshadow. Yeah. That's it. Okay. May 16th. Yes. That Chariots of Fire. Okay, we're done listening to Chariots of Fire. Now we have... The wonderful stylings of Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder oh. and the number one charts. From May 15th all the way to July. The number one song. Stevie Wonder and Paul McCartney duet. I, all I can think of is Ebony and Ivory. Ebony is it? and Ivory. Because I, I, for a minute I thought that was Michael Jackson and, and Paul McCartney. No, that was Say, Say, Say okay, and The Girl Is Mine. Did. Okay, Ebony and Ivory. Also the same year. Okay. But... I thought, people, I thought you were going to be make fun of me mercilessly. Well, I thought you were going to... Because th- I have a lot of misrememberings of Michael Jackson related things. Well, that's just, just racism on your part. Thinking no. Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson are the same guy. Stop it. <laughs> are you not? Uh, no, but uh, I would thought you would think it was Frank Sinatra and Stevie Wonder. because of No, the, the I Saturday know the difference Live between thing. Saturday Night Live and 
real life. <laughs> you are black and I am white. <laughs> You are blind as a bat, yep. and I have sight. Side by side, you are my amigo, Negro, let's not fight. <laughs> you know who played that part? It was, uh, oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, Eddie Murphy was Steve Wonder, obviously. Yeah. yeah. It was like, um, who was it? Joe Piscopo. Yeah, Joe Piscopo, that's Of course. Right. That was like the only thing he did on that show. And he, did, he was Doug and Wendy Weiner. Oh, he was. But he couldn't... Uh, his Frank Sinatra was blown out of the water by Phil Hartman. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got chunks of guys like you in my stool. <laughs> yeah. uh, Phil Hartman, the best. Yeah. Rest in peace. But that was number one for a long time. May 15th, all the way to July 2nd. Wow. All summer, everybody's rocking rockin out to that. Ebony and Ivory. Ebony and Ivory. I bet that really did a lot for race relations. Though, don't you think? You think? Don't you think racists were like, took the hood off? And we're like, oh. No. <laughs> yeah. And oh, just let's like, not fight. Yeah, they all just Why are we doing other. this anyway? Let's just do some coke together. Let's just, let's just be friends. May 28th. Rocky Three was released, nineteen eighty-two. I never saw. I, I saw the first. Wait, what? One. I know I saw the first wait, one. What? I think I saw wait, the second one. Wait, what? But I've never seen any other. You ones. didn't see the one with Clubber Lang? No. Uh, by far the That's greatest what I heard. Rocky movie. Yes. Oh my god. Oh god. What? I never saw Mr. it. Mr. T. Hulk Hogan. Yeah, I, don't, I never. saw This it. is why you don't like wrestling. No, I guarantee that. No, that's not gonna this will my change. Mind about wrestling. This will change you. No, it will Let's not. Let's go back in time and make you watch it. Oh my god, I had an action figure for Mr. T from this movie. Did you? I had a Rocky and a Mr. T and a. Oh my God, the best. Mr. T, this is when he became a superstar. My whole world was Mr. Mr. T. T. I had so many Mr. T action figures. Yeah, you know, you still do. I love Mr. T. He's yeah. the greatest thing ever. And he's, oh, he beat cancer, man. I know. You can't stop Mr. T. No, you can't. That's true. He said like 12,000 people auditioned for that role and they gave it to Mr. T. Was, that, was he an unknown before that? He was a bodyguard that they found, yeah. I yeah, think, in, yeah. In, was it Chicago, right? Uh, in a bar in Chicago. Yeah, he's from Chicago area. He was a bouncer, and he won. I remember somebody some, I, saw I him. I talked to somebody once that that knew him. Yeah, he he was. They saw him on TV. The people when they were yeah. film, they were casting this because he was on a. They had a televised bouncer competition. Oh, and he was. Where on they the, threw midgets yeah. like to see how far they could throw them and stuff. That's such an 80s little thing to people. Do. Uh, they threw people and they like tore people's gold. Like that's how I got all the gold chains oh, and tear them off of people. Yeah. Uh, in clubs, he's kicking people out. Um, but with Rocky Three, according to an interview given by Mr. T, he attended the movie's premiere with his mother. During the scene where he yells lurid remarks at Adrian, mm -hmm. his mother turned to him and said, I did not raise you to talk to a lady like that. She then stormed out of the theater. Oh, she didn't, <laughs> doesn't know the difference between a movie and real life. <laughs> Probably not. No, Mr. Not. T didn't grow up with a lot of money. No, it's true. Uh, Hulk Hogan uh, received the initial offer to be in the movie after a wrestling match against Andre the Giant at Shea Stadium. At first, he thought it was one of the other wrestlers trying to pull a prank on him. And But when he returned from a tour of Japan, Hogan received a Western Union letter he had to sign for. The contents sylvester stallone's offer to be in the movie he immediately signed on for the role of thunder lips and so in that i guess i didn't realize he was in that too yeah so in rocky three rocky you know the first rocky rocky's just this poor guy that like yeah. gets lucky and wins a fight or whatever it's like the ultimate underdog story and then uh rocky two is it the russian remember. one no, that's four. Oh. Uh, but by Rocky Three, he's famous. Like yeah. he's a superstar or whatever. And so there's a big promotional thing where it's like, oh, he's going to fight a wrestler. Yeah. But, and he jokes about it being fake, but Hulk Hogan is like this big bad guy. And he really mm -hmm. like beats the crap out of him and stuff. Uh, but Hulk Hogan was, he was coming up to this superstar. Like this was right before he became a oh, super, really? superstar. Oh, really? Does he it was a big getting, part? He has a big part in it? No, it's just a little part oh. at the beginning. But, yeah. but, I mean, took wrestling from being just yeah. a thing, like a little side yard, a thing. side thing to. Yeah. Of the national stage yeah. and he was starting to shoot up as a superstar Vince McMahon senior told him don't do that don't do that movie don't oh. do movies wrestlers don't do movies not in my business whatever it is and he did anyway. and he did it anyway and so they they stopped booking him I guess in WWF oh so he went to the WWF in New York whatever so I think that's what sent him to AWA or whatever he had to do but yeah. when it so that but it did so much for his superstardom yeah that it made him a superstar and they had they, they had to get him back. Crap. Yeah. And then he became the franchise. Of, I mean, yeah, he put he wrestling was, on the map. But Rocky Three, without Rocky Three, wrestling probably would have never got as big as it did. And Hogan, who knows if Hogan would have been as big. Maybe he would have. Who knows? But Thank God. Thank God. Oh, my God. Thank God. Thank God for you. WWE Network. Thank God for me. Thank God for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God for Joe Christian. What? Remember he said he's wrestling? Oh, yeah. June 4th, Poltergeist came out. I used to love that movie. Starring Drew it's, Barrymore. Does not, it does not hold up well, though. It's really a big vagina, that closet. What? Poltergeist? Yeah. When they go, it's it, just the graphics don't stand up. You mean? It's yeah, it's so stupid looking. And the, I mean, the closet turns into a giant vagina that sucks everybody in. I don't remember. I mean, it's like slimy on the no, inside. You made you go see that when they re-released it. I never made you go see Poltergeist. I think you did. Remember they re-released it in. That was Chicago. The Exorcist. Oh. Yeah, that's different. I don't think I know the difference. I think I, no. thought, I, think I thought till just now, I think I yeah. thought they were the same thing. No, nope. you don't know. I should act like you. You don't know that Poltergeist and the Exorcist are different I don't, movies? because that's stupid. Well, They're Poltergeist... Stupid. Anybody did, likes either one of them as a jerk. Poltergeist, at the time, was very scary. I remember being scared when I saw it. Really? But, um... Poltergeist. 
first. Well, I was a little kid too. Huh. But the um, I think I thought they were the same thing. No, that's the one where she goes in the TV. The little girl goes into the TV. That's Exorcist. No, that's Poltergeist. Nobody oh. goes in a TV in the Exorcist. They don't. No. Horror movies are so dumb. But Drew Barrymore was considered for the role of Carol Ann, but director Steven Spielberg wanted someone more angelic. You know, there's a big curse with that movie too. Like the little girl died. Yeah, that's what I was gonna tell and you. And the the older girl, the older sister died. Yeah, well, Barrymore's audition for this role is what landed her the part in E.T., but two of the film's cast members were subsequently murdered after Polter- right. Poltergeist. Dominic Dunn. Dominique. W- Dominique yeah. Dunn was strangled by her former boyfriend, John mm-hmm. Thomas Sweeney, in the driveway of her West Hollywood home on October 30th, 1982, yep. and having been declared brain dead, died five days, five days later at the age of 22. Yes. And Lou Perryman Pugsley was killed with an axe by a 26-year-old man named Seth Christopher Tatum in Austin, Texas, Jeez. on April 1st, 2009. Yeah. He was 67 years old at the time of his death. So, well, I mean, and the girl who played Carol Ann died, too. The little girl. Yeah, but she wasn't murdered. These no, two were murdered. murdered. Yeah. Two people were murdered from that. That's crazy. Is it the curse? Maybe a poltergeist, poltergeist is a real thing. Also on June 4th, the same day Poltergeist came out, Star mm-hmm. Trek II The Wrath of Khan also came out. Did it? Are you a big Star Trek No, never II saw. Wrath of Khan never seen. Never seen any of those. I re- it was Ricardo Montalban played yes, Khan. Yes, that's right. You knew that? Yeah, I, did. <clears throat> I remember that. Yeah. Kirk and Khan never met face to face during the movie. All their interactions through view screens or communicators. That's because Ricardo Montalban filmed his scenes separately from the main production in order to accommodate his schedule of filming Fantasy, Fantasy Island. Fantasy Island. Yeah. Welcome to Fantasy Island. And this this will help you with Star Trek mm-hmm. geeks if you ever need to like get mm-hmm. somewhere with them. Uh, it's, there's a Star Trek running gag that there's a Federation embargo against Romulan ale, but this uh, still doesn't prevent resourceful people like Dr. McCoy using medicinal privileges as a loophole from procuring some for Admiral Kirk What are you Kirk talking about present. right now? And many Star Trek captains and flag officers have over the years in Star Trek canon viewed it as something of a status symbol, much like Cuban cigars in the United States, Romulan ale. I don't know what you just so said. So if you see somebody who's like a Star Trek fan, you're like, hey, you want to go drink some Romulan ale later? I won't do that. I'm not going to do, do that. I'm you can really that. earn their trust. Nope. Star Trek fans are idiots no, no you know they're fucking no, no, losers don't listen don't if you're listening this. to this podcast and you're no, a star trek fan stop, turn it off you're not welcome just no. kidding no i actually love star trek fans you do not i do you don't have a feeling one way or the other i i love everyone i know all right what's but next? i like nerdy people all right what's next june 8th sports oh, the lakers win the nba championship magic johnson was the mvp pat riley was the coach they beat the sixers four games to two okay june 11th movies et Yep, was released. E.T. the extraterrestrial. Yeah, I remember that. Harrison Ford to, was in. Put Harrison Reese's Ford pieces was, on the. Harrison Ford was in it. No, he was not. He was, and the scene got cut. He filmed a cameo. Oh, Both. really? Because remember his wife at the time. Oh, that's wrote, right. Wrote it. Okay. Uh, but the Reese's pieces thing. Yeah. Originally it was Eminem's, but guess who said no? You can't use us in your stupid crappy little. Eminem movie. said that. Eminem said no, so they used Reese's pieces. And Reese's pieces and were put on the map. And Reese's pieces went to the top. Yes, they did. And Eminem's probably regretted it. I'm sure they they're, did. They're fine. They're doing fine. Uh, because if you look at the novel version, it's still M&M's because that's what it was written in the script. Oh. Yep. So, boom. I just schooled you on E.T. Uh, and some Oh, uh, E.T.'s voice mm-hmm. was provided by Pat Welsh, an elderly woman who lived in uh, Marin <laughs> County, California. And it's she, always like some old she lady. She smoked two packs of cigarettes a day, which gave her voice a quality that sound effects creator Ben Burt liked. That's like the, this is the Exorcist, oh, too. No. The Exorcist, too. There was the, for the demon's voice, it was some old lady. Some old woman. Yeah, and she smoked and drank and drank scotch and smoked all these cigarettes. So she Next time I see an old woman sitting at the end of a bar smoking a cigarette, I'm going to say, hey. Are you studying for a role as e. a demon or an alien by any chance? E.T.'s voice. Now, they also used different... Uh, uh, they, it was that old woman's voice, plus it was... It was uh, a, the other sounds E.T. made were a combination of raccoons, sea otters, horses, Deborah Winger, Bert's sleeping wife who had a cold, a burp from his USC film professor. Okay. I don't know why <laughs> Deborah Winger is in there, but yeah. June 29th, mm-hmm. Universal Studios sued Nintendo over alleged similarities between King Kong and Donkey Kong. Did they? Yeah. They were like, you can't have that video game. You copied off of King Kong. And not only did they lose, but the court found a King Kong game that Universal License was actually in violation of Nintendo's copyrights. Oh. Boom. Boom, bitch. Oh, Boom. Give me your money, bitch, is what they said. That's me. right. Boom. Donkey Kong wins, bitch. I didn't know you were such a Nintendo fan. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're no, really I just love somebody. Goes, somebody tries to sue somebody else, and I guess what? Not only did you lose, yeah, then you, yeah, get you sued. pay me. Yep. You pay me, bitch. All right. Sorry. July second. This is from Wikipedia. Okay. Lawrence Larry Richard Walters. Do you know who this is? No. You sure? Lawrence? Lawn chair Larry. Have you ever heard of this? No. July second, nineteen eighty-two. Mm-hmm. Lawn chair pilot. Lawn chair Larry. Okay. Sound familiar? No. He was an American truck driver who took flight on July second, nineteen eighty-two, in a homemade airship. Dubbed Inspiration One, the flying machine. Okay. Consisted of an ordinary patio chair with 45 helium filled weather balloons <laughs> attached to it. Uh, Walters rose to an altitude of over 15,000 feet. 
and floated from Did he really? point of origin in San Pedro, California into controlled airspace near LA International Airport. So wait, they were hot air balloons? Reported. Or they were helium filled balloons. How did they how do you get enough helium balloons to lift a person? Walters had often dreamed of flying, but he was unable to become a pilot in the United States Air Force because of his, because of his poor eyesight. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> he first thought of using weather balloons to fly at age 13 or 14 after seeing them hang from the ceiling of a military surplus store. Yeah. 20 years later, he decided to try it. His intention was to float over the Mojave Desert and then use a pellet gun to burst balloons to gracefully float to the ground. In mid-1982, Walters and his girlfriend, Carol Van Dusen, mm-hmm. I think that was the murderer lady from a couple episodes ago. No, that, that was the classic. Carol um, Bundy. Mm. I wish it was her. Anyway, he and his girlfriend purchased 45 eight foot, eight foot weather balloons and obtained helium tanks from California Toy Time Balloons. They used a forged requisition from his employer, Film Flare Studio, Film Fair Studios, saying mm-hmm. the balloons were for a television commercial. On July 2nd, 1982, Walters attached the balloons to his lawn chair, filled them with helium, put on a parachute, and strapped himself into the chair in the backyard of his home, of a home on 7th Street in San Pedro. He took his pellet gun, a CB radio, sandwiches, beer, and a camera. Mm-hmm. When his friends... Cut the cord that tied his lawn chair to his Jeep. Walter's lawn chair rose rapidly to a height of about 16,000 feet. Whoa. And, and was spotted from two commercial airliners. In a lawn chair. Can you believe that? At first, he did not dare shoot any balloons, fearing that he might unbalance the load and cause himself to fall out. He slowly drifted over Long Beach and crossed the primary approach corridor of Long Beach Airport. He was in contact with React, a citizens band radio monitoring organization who recorded their conversation. React says, what information do you wish me to tell the airport at this time to your location and your difficulty? Larry says, uh, the difficulty is, uh, this was an unauthorized balloon launch, and uh, <laughs> I know I'm in a federal airspace, and uh, I'm sure my ground crew was alerted to the proper authority, but uh, just call them and tell them I'm okay. <laughs> After 45 minutes in the sky, he shot several balloons and then accidentally dropped his pellet gun overboard. Oh, my God. He descended slowly until the balloons dangling the balloons dangling cables got caught in a power line. Oh, no. Causing a 20-minute electricity blackout in, long, in a long range <laughs> oh, neighborhood. Geez. Walters was able to climb to the ground. He was... a Immediately arrested by waiting members of the Long Beach Police Department, oh my God. Regional Safety Inspector Neil Savoy was reported to have said, "We know he broke some part of the Federal Aviation Act, and as soon as we decide which part, it, which part it is, some type of cha- charge will be filed. Yeah. If he had a pilot's license, we'd suspend that, but he doesn't." <laughs> <laughs> Walter Walters He's initially, in a lunch here with balloons. <laughs> yeah, what the hell? Walters initially was fined four thousand dollars for violations under U.S. Federal Aviation regulations, including operating an aircraft within an airport traffic area, uh, and it was later reduced to fifteen hundred dollars. Um, I still don't know how you get enough helium balloons to lift a human body. He had only 45, but they were big, giant yeah. balloons. Uh, just after landing, Walter spoke to the press and said, it was something I had to do. I had this dream for 20 years. If I hadn't done it, I think I would have ended up in the funny farm. Oh, my God. July 3rd. The Human League, Don't You Want Me, becomes number oh. one. Don't you want right. me, baby. Mm-hmm. Don't you want me. Uh, 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 uh. The lyrics, it was originally written as just one guy singing it, and they changed it to a duet, but um, uh, one of the teenage, it's a teenage female vocalist is on there, but um, but the guy who wrote it points out that it's not a love song, but a nasty song about sexual power politics, because mm-hmm. if you listen to the words, right. he's actually saying, you you were nothing before me, you were right. breaking of course. me, and I'm going to kill you, kind yeah. of thing. and uh, which is sad. July 9th, Tron, mm-hmm. the 1982 oh, film Tron. I remember that. It was not nominated for an Academy Award for visual effects because the use of computers was considered cheating. Oh. Yeah, how about that? Yeah. I remember seeing. How about that? I remember seeing Tron. I never saw it. I remember getting Tron, um, Tron glasses from like, McDonald's or something. Really? Yeah. You still have them? No. What? They were drinking glasses. You know how McDonald's used to always give gl- drinking oh, yeah. glasses, like yeah. real glass drinking glasses. They had like the Muppets. And, and you can always get those at Goodwill. Snoopy and stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's and right. Now yeah. they're probably worth money. They probably are all those ones. Yeah. Well, what's that place we used to go to in Chicago? They had all that old kids stuff. Fun. Uncle Fun would have all that yeah. stuff. Muppets glasses. Yeah, and, Muppets and Snoopy. Yeah, and stuff. Snoopy and everything. July twenty third. Uh, the Twilight Zone, the movie. Remember that? Yes, I remember. So seeing this that. was being filmed on July twenty third, nineteen eighty two, and. Uh, there an onset accident took the lives of Vic Morrow and two child actors. Wow. Micah Din, Din Lee and Rene Shinyi Chen on the set of the Twilight Zone, the movie. Uh, a helicopter crashed on them during filming of a Vietnam battle sequence. I don't remember a Vietnam battle sequence in that movie. I never saw that movie, but um, Vic Morrow was waiting to, as he was waiting to film what would turn out to be the scene that killed him. He said to a production assistant, I must be out of my mind to be doing this. I should have asked for a stunt double. What can they do but kill me, right? Oh. While he was filming... Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry, he insisted on having a $1 million life insurance policy before he would shoot any scenes involving a heli- the helicopter in which he was due to ride. He was very insistent, and when asked why, Morrow replied, 
I've always had a premonition I was going to die in a helicopter crash. Did he? And then he did. Wow. Crazy, huh? That is crazy. July 24th, 1982. A new number one song on the Billboard charts, Survivor, Eye of the Tiger. Oh, yes. The Eye of the, the tiger. tiger. So this was the song for Rocky. Yeah. Uh, Rocky 3, apparently. Yeah. And um, they, 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 Sylvester Snow originally wanted Another One Bites the Dust. Oh. And Queen said, eh, eh. That's right. Eh, eh. Queen don't tell out. Queen said, hell no. Okay. Oh, also, several Republicans have tried to use Eye of the Tiger oh, for yeah? their campaign things. Mm-hmm. And Survivor sued the hell out of them all. Good. Uh, Newt Gingrich got sued. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mike Huckabee got sued trying to use it. Mitt Romney tried to use it and got sued. They all got sued. But <laughs> you can't use Eye of the Tiger, God damn it. That's funny. Survivor's still around? I don't somewhere. think they're still around. I mean, somewhere, but they're just like, how many yeah. people they can't use it? Get the royalties. But they must make so much off of royalties. I know. How, how many people want to use Eye of the Tiger? Seriously. August 19th. Um, you know, I just remembered, I think... When I was in middle school, I think the cheerleaders used Eye of the Tiger to uh, do a dance to at our middle school gymnasium. I bet they didn't get the rights. I'm going to let Survivor know. To sue, you should. Just sue them. Yeah, or my middle school cheerleaders. Yeah, you should. August 19th, sports. Atlanta Braves had a 25-year-old right-hander named Pasquale Perez. He was mm-hmm. scheduled to start a, a getaway game against Montreal. Driving along I-285 to the stadium, Perez missed his exit. Unfamiliar with Atlanta, side streets, he'd only been traded there a few weeks before. He was still early for the game. He decided to take I-285 all the way around. It's a loop freeway all the way around Atlanta. It goes 64 oh, miles. kind of like yeah. 485 here. And he <laughs> got all the way around. And he missed his exit again. Oh, my uh, God. Uh, and we need to how, turn around. How many just times? I don't know. He just kept going. So he, he did that at least twice. Some people think three times. Um What's he ran out of him? gas and he pulled out in a convenience store eventually. And the clerk saw him. He was like, aren't you supposed to be pitching this game? I was like, yeah. Anyway, uh, he... He didn't make it. He game. didn't make it to the game? Yeah. And so Phil Negro had to, had to play for him instead. One of the Negroes. Um, and Atlanta won the game. So it's a good thing he missed it. But his name yeah. nickname became Perimeter Pasquale. Okay. He was later murdered. No. Uh, no, he was. Was he really? He was murdered by a robbery or something. Oh, a lot, wow. A lot later. Not that year. But yeah. September 4th, 1982. Mm-hmm. New number one song on the Billboard charts. Steve Miller Band. Um, The Joker? Abra, Abra, Oh, I forget Cadabra. that that's the Steve Miller band. I gotta reach out and grab ya. Yeah, the Joker was the 70s. Anyway, Capitol Music told him, don't release it. That song's gonna suck. Nobody's gonna like it. And then it hit number one. And he said, in your effing face, you efforts. It's kind of a stupid song. Yeah, it is. It's not great. Yeah. yeah so. Steve Miller bands can be kind of crappy, though. Steve Miller can be pretty crappy yeah. sometimes. But other times it can be great. Yeah. Sometimes I like almost take my shirt off in the Prius uh, when yeah. I listen to it. Like I just, I do like a half shirt. I just get my belly out in my Prius when I listen to it. It's weird. September 11th. 1982, mm-hmm. Chicago Hard to Say I'm Sorry became took over the number one spot. Okay. Hard to say I'm sorry. Oh, yes. That sounds bad. It's a slow kind of mm-hmm. crap songs. Uh, September 29th. Yes. Do you have anything for that? I do. On September 29th, 1982, 12-year-old Mary Kellerman of Elk Grove Village, Illinois, woke up at dawn, went into her parents' bedroom. She didn't feel well. She had a sore throat, a runny nose. Uh, How so old? 12. Oh. To make her feel better, her mom gave her one extra strength Tylenol capsule. And at 7 a.m., they found Mary on the bathroom floor. She was immediately taken to the hospital where she was later pronounced dead. <sighs> Doctors initially suspected she died from a stroke, but evidence later pointed to a more sinister diagnosis. This is the Chicago Tylenol murders. That same night that. Yes. You know, she, that was probably in the morning she died. Yes. That night, Family Ties aired an episode with Stephen and Elise went away for the weekend mm-hmm. and Alex hosts a wild party and worries over Mallory going off with one of his womanizing friends. Oh. Also, Facts of Life uh, had an episode where due to budget cuts at Eastland, Joe was going to lose her scholarship mm-hmm. with a deadline to find another at the end of the week. She's excited to find the one for which she qualifies mm-hmm. until she discovers that it's funded by Blair's family. Oh, Fucking Blair. Blair, that bitch. Goddamn Blair. Back to that cyanide. Uh, so that same day, para- paramedics were called to Arlington Heights home of 27-year-old postal worker Adam Janus. When they arrived, they found him lying on the floor. His breathing was labored. Blood pressure was low. Pupils fixed and dilated. They rushed him to the emergency room where they attempted to resuscitate him, but it was too late. He died shortly after he was brought to the hospital. And his death was believed to be a massive heart attack. However, his doctors would later learn that he also had a autopsy mis- mysterious death. On the eve of his death, his um, his family they go to the funeral. Yeah. Then they um, they go and gather at his house to mourn his death. Wait. And discuss the funeral. Yeah. No, they don't go to the funeral. They 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 go to his house to discuss the. I was funeral. say his funeral already on the same no, day. No. No. Okay. Um, 
Adam's 25-year-old brother Stanley and his 19-year-old bride Teresa both suffered from headaches attributed to the stress of losing a family member. Oh, no. And to his relief, Stanley found on Adam's kitchen counter a bottle of extra strength Tylenol, took a capsule from the bottle and gave one to his wife. And then shortly after taking those, they both collapsed on the floor. And the shocked family members immediately called an ambulance. Once again, paramedics rushed to the home. Immediately they fell, like right as soon as they took the pill? Yeah. Huh. They, um, they rushed right to the home, attempted to resuscitate them, but Stanley died that day and his wife died two days later. Um, so the hospital started to get suspicious following the death of the three family members. It was suspected that poisonous gas could have caused mm, the untimely Yeah, I guess you think that first. Um, however, they consulted with another doctor um, at a poison center. It was determined that cyanide might be the culprit. Blood samples were taken from the victims and sent to a lab for testing. So they go and they, the blood samples are being tested for cyanide. There's these two firefighters in another location of Chicago um, discussing these four bizarre deaths that have recently taken place in the neighboring areas. Um, Arlington Heights firefighter Philip Capitelli talked with his friend Richard Keyworth from the Elk Grove Firehouse. Oh, Richard Keyworth. Yeah, about Mary Kellerman and the fact she'd taken Tylenol before she died. And Keyworth suggested that it all could have been related to the medicine. I bet that's related. So that could be related, yeah. Man. Cal, fal, so Capitelli, the first firefighter, calls the paramedics who worked Capitelli. on Janus, the Janus family and asked yeah. them if they had too taken Tylenol. And to both the men's surprise, they discovered all three the family members had ingested Tylenol. We got a Tylenol problem here. So then the police were immediately... Uh, sent to the Kellerman and the Janus homes to re- retrieve the suspicious bottles. Then the following day, um, the Cook County's chief toxicologist examined the capsules and discovered they were filled with 65 milligrams of deadly cyanide, 10,000 times more than the amount needed to kill the average person. Oh, that's why which they is why so they fast. Right, that's right. So, yep. cyanide, it's like tablets? They, they, they put it in, the, it was, it's powder, and they put it in the capsules. So it's just capsules. So they, they dumped out the Tylenol. Yes, right. And they put the cyanide in it and put, cyanide in it and put, put the capsules, capsules back, back together. together and put them in. So That's right. No way you would know there was anything wrong with it. Like right. You couldn't, you couldn't. There's nothing you could do. Right, uh, right. So um, the remember, Johnson & Johnson was immediately alerted to the the, the deaths. Yo, Johnson. Get Johnson. Um, and an, an October 1982 Newsweek article reported the company began a massive recall on October 5th, 1982. Oh, just, just everything in Tylenol. Chicago or just how are they tracing Massive. You? I think it was... Yeah. Yeah. I remember it was like, don't take Tylenol when I was a kid. Yeah. I remember my mom would freak out, cyanide, yeah. or cyanide and pills. I was yeah, like, what? right. what's cyanide? Right. What is this? And, but um, uh, did you have anything for October 5th? Tell me what's happened. You tell me what happened on October this 5th. This is when they recalled. Johnson Johnson recalled all the Tylenol. They recalled on October 5th? On October 5th. Johnson Johnson recalled that Tylenol the same day that LeVar Burton and Lynn Redgrave were on the $10,000 pyramid. <laughs> God. <laughs> we had to know that. Yeah. Um, but on, they recalled it October 5th, but by then it was too late. For three more victims of the deadly poison-laced Tylenol capsules. Oh, no. So 27-year-old Mary Reiner of Winfield, Illinois, was recovering after the birth of her son oh. when she unsuspectedly ingested Tylenol laced with cyanide. Because you're going to take Tylenol a lot yeah. if you have a baby. Yep. That same day, 35-year-old Paula Prince was found dead in her suburban Chicago apartment. Cyanide-filled Tylenol capsules were also found in her home. The seventh known victim Those of Tylenol... Is all suburban Chicago? Mm-hmm. It's all like mm-hmm. Oak... Mm-hmm. Or the is it the Oak seventh Park? known victim of the Tylenol poisonings was 35-year-old Mary McFarland of Elmhurst, oh. Illinois. Um, so soon, there's, it gets on national news. Uh, there's widespread sw- fear sweeps through the country, especially in Chicago and the suburbs. Uh, the police actually drove through the streets with loudspeakers, warning citizens Tell not, to take, not to take Tylenol. Yeah, um, oh and that made people even more freaked out. Um, and then, according to a Time article, hospitals in the Chicago area were flooded with telephone calls concerning Tylenol and the fears of poisoning. Oh that it was this growing nationwide panic. It prompted the head of Seattle's Poison Control Center to inform citizens that if they had indeed been poisoned with cyanide, they'd be dead before they were even able to make a telephone call. Yeah, you can't even do like, anything. Yeah, so don't even worry. You're going to be dead before, which would even make you more freaked out, I think. Nevertheless, hospitals around the country admitted many patients under the suspicion of t- cyanide poisoning from Tylenol. Newsweek's October 1982 issue stated that some health departments actually banned all forms of Tylenol products, and many retailers completely removed it. How did they ever recover it. from that? I know it. You'd think that would be just gone forever. Well, it was yeah, the other reputation was ruined by the scare because no one wanted to buy their products. I, I always felt like Advil works better anyway. The future of the company depended on how they were able to handle the situation. The Johnson & Johnson issues a na- nationwide alert to the public, doctors, and distributors of the drug which was one good thing they did. Then they also issued the massive recall of 31 million Tylenol bottles, which cost about $125 million. 31 million, because they had no idea where it was coming yep. from. And they also had a crisis hotlines. Following inspections, the company determined the cyanide was not introduced into the bottles at the factory, which led to only the other possibility that someone had taken the Tylenol bottles off the shelves at the store where they were sold, filled the capsules with cyanide, and returned them back to the shelves at a later period. 
They had no evidence as to who might have committed the crime, and there was continuing fear that more deaths might occur unless they caught the Tylenol terrorists. And how do you even track it to what store if the person who bought it died? Right. They can't tell you where they bought it? No, they could, They did. They, they, they could track some mm-hmm. of them? So on t- October 2nd, 1982... Oh, you mean when John Cougar Mellencamp's Jack and Diane became the number one song on the Billboard charts? That's what I mean. That's it. Um, another contaminated Tylenol Little bottle ditty. was, sh- stop it. It was oh, discovered by police from a batch of bottles removed from a drugstore in Chicago's suburbs. So they found another contaminated bottle. They found bottle. a whole other bottle yep. at the store before anybody died from taking it? Yes. Because October 2nd is also the same day that Kamala the Uganda Giant made his debut in Mid-South Wrestling against Tim Horner. Oh, okay. Also, on TV that night... Uh, there was a Give Me a Break episode where Nail Carter goes to jail uh, because they- I remember that episode. They mistakenly cut her phone service off yeah. for non-payment. I remember that episode. You remember that? You I remember also, her going to jail, yeah. The Different Strokes also was on that night, and there was called Shootout at the OK Arcade, and in his efforts to help Willis dethrone an arrogant video game champion at the local arcade, Arnold becomes hooked on video games. Jeez. It's a very special it's a very episode. Special episode. Strokes. So investigators- Thousands of other bottles were undergoing testing for traces of cyanide. Investigators had no idea how many other bottles might have been tampered with. Uh, They offered a $1,000 reward for information. They discovered the cyanide lace capsules were placed in six Chicago area stores. The Jewel, the Jewel, the Osco, um, Walgreens, and Frank's Finer Foods. Each store contained one tampered bottle with approximately three to ten tainted capsules, except for the Osco drugstore where two cyanide lace bottles were recovered. So it was suggested by the police that the bottles were randomly placed. However, mm. there was also a possibility the terrorists may have purposely chosen those specific locations for an unknown reason. Mm. Um, some thought the terrorists might have held a grudge against the producers of Tylenol or society in general or even the stores where the, the bottles were found. And they thought maybe he lived in the vicinity where the drugs were she. sold. Or she. It's um, a Me Too movement, baby. That's true. Murderers can be ladies You're right. too. So the toxicologist revealed the specific type of poison used following tests on them, which was potassium cyanide. It was mostly inv- available to industries like gold and silver mining, fertilizer production, steel plating, film processing, and chemical manufacturing. So they thought the poisoner could have gotten it from a place he worked, like at a related job. Mm. Um, but there was very little evidence for investigators to work on. So they start a man- nationwide manhunt. Um, or woman hunt. Although the... <laughs> Although poison has historically been a weapon predominantly used by women to kill, Boom. they focus their search for on an unknown male in connection with the crimes. So then they take their first suspect into custody. Oh, they got suspects, huh? Yes. There was a 48-year-old amateur chemist and dock hand that worked at a warehouse that supplied Tylenol to two of the stores where the tainted bottles were sold. And he became the FBI uh, primary suspect. The police thought that he admitted to having worked on a project that involved the use of cyanide. And it also said that after a search of his apartment, investigators found various weapons, two one-way tickets to Thailand, and a mm. suspicious book that described how to kill people by stuffing poison into capsules. Um, although they lacked hard evidence connecting this guy, they charged him with illegal possession of firearms, and he was sent to jail and eventually released. So they didn't find, end up finding mm. any hard evidence against him. Could have been that guy, though. So shortly following the murders, Johnson & Johnson receives this handwritten extortion letter demanding a million dollars for an uh. end to the poisonings. The extortionist asked them to respond to his demand um, through the Chicago Tribune. But instead, they contacted the authorities who began to trace the letter's source. It didn't take long to trace the letter to a man named James W. Lewis, who was a tax accountant and known con artist, who also sought, who was also sought in the connection with the brutal murder of an elderly man in Kansas City and a jewel robbery. So they issue a warrant for his arrest in connection with the Tylenol killings. Um, they conduct a massive search for him and his wife, Leanne. It led them across several states. Yeah. Photographs and wanted posters were distributed. And then during the last week of October... Let's pause and mention that on October 20th, the Cardinals beat the Brewers in Game 7 of the World Series. Whitey Herzog was the manager of the St. Louis Cardinals, where you're from. That's this right. is where you said they played Cool in the Gang celebration. celebration. Ozzie Smith was a Cardinal. Yes, this was, was called, a big deal. This was called and the, Willie McGee was the other big deal. Terrell Porter was the MVP. Oh, though. and that's right. That's, I remember him. This was called the Sud Series because it was St. Louis, mm-hmm. the Anheuser-Busch... Brewery, yeah. ...against... Milwaukee, oh, the Miller Brewery. That's right. Um, and then on October 30th, uh, Who Can It Be Now by Men at Work was the number one song. And that was written in a treehouse uh, with he and his girlfriend. They wrote it. Uh, the Men at Work guy with the floaty eye? Who can it be now? Does he have a floaty eye? I don't recall a floaty eye. I don't think he had a floaty eye. You are obsessed with floaty eyes. No, that's the first time I've ever mentioned it. No, but he was living in uh, an apartment complex in St. Kilda, Victoria, next to a bunch of drug dealers, so people would often knock on his door on accident. Oh, and that's where he came up with it. he was always scared. That's when he wrote that. Who can it be knocking at my door? During the last week of October, lab technicians in Chicago discovered yet another unsold tainted bottle of Tylenol. Taint. It was found less <laughs> It was found less than one block from where Paula Prince purchased the bottle containing the cyanide lace capsules. Oh. Um, it was examined for fingerprints and other clues that might le- lead to the 
murderer. That same week, a man named Robert Richardson sent a letter to the Chicago Tribune stating that Dear Tribune. he and his wife did not take part in the Tylenol murders and that they were unarmed. We did not take part and we are unarmed. That was one of the many aliases used by James W. Lewis after his arrest of the elderly boss in Kansas City. So right. that's, They just wrote a letter saying that yeah. they're unarmed? No, they said that they did not do the Tylenol killings. Then November 6th, Joe Cocker and Jennifer Warren's Up Where We Belong okay. became the number one song. I always get Joe Cocker and Joe Walsh mixed up. <laughs> Joe Walsh doesn't sing, does he? Yes, he does. Joe Walsh is a guitarist, right? He, sings, he sings all those silly songs. like. Um, Isn't Joe Walsh a guitarist for Aerosmith? N- no, Joe Walsh. He sings like, <sighs> I don't know, I, I can't think of it. Um, he sings all those goofy songs. About the going to party and I don't remember. Yes, it. Who was this? Who was the guitarist for Aerosmith that I'm thinking of? I don't know. Joe Walsh. Maybe there's two Joe Walshes. Um, Maybe it's corrections. Steve Walsh. Maybe it's corrections and apologies. Variable. Anyway, um, they had to like beg Joe Cocker to do that song. He really didn't want to do it, yeah. and he did it. And then they say that he th- he felt like it ruined his legacy. Is, oh yeah, because it's because he was like a cool rocker guy, and then yeah. he became that. November 11th, 1982. And November 11th. Yes. What, what happened on November 11th? There, there was a news conference that Johnson & Johnson held. So Johnson Johnson is getting ready for this news conference. Yes. Meanwhile, Merv Griffin and Brooke Shields are on David Letterman. Joni loves chachis on TV. Yeah. Uh, and that specific episode is called Beatlemania because while visiting her friend who's a nurse, Joni is convinced mm-hmm. that she saw Paul McCartney at the hospital. Okay. And also, Too Close for Comfort was on television. Also, mm-hmm. November 11th, 1982, Lil Dave from Another Bad Creation was born. All right. Remember ABC? Yes. ABC, BBD, okay. Aisha, oh, that's you awful. are good. All right, all right. Little Dave was born. Okay, so November 11th, Johnson & Johnson announces at a news conference that they have, they're have they re, reintroducing Tylenol products with this new safety packaging. That can't ever be tampered, tampered. with. That's while Little Dave is being born. That's right. They spent all this this money to advertise it, and they gave this big coupons and all this stuff. Did they mention that Little Dave was but born? But it took, it took less than two months, and then everybody was buying Tylenol again. And That's it. They were re- they were able to regain more than not 90- my mom. My mom didn't buy it for years. Ni- they were able to regain more than ninety eight percent of the market share they had before the crisis. Wow, um, that's real quick bounce. Back. So one month uh, after Tylenol reintroduces that, FBI agents receive their biggest tip in the connection with Lewis's whereabouts. So they're still looking for him. Still looking for that guy. After a ten week search, they received information from a librarian who saw she saw him on several occasions at the New York Public Library. She I saw that weirdo. She said she was able to recognize him from the wanted posters at her workplace. He looks just like the poster, and he kept scratching his armpits. So then on December 13th, 1982. Okay, real quick. November 27th, Lionel Richie's Truly became number one. Awful. That is an awful song. Awful. awful, awful. I love Lionel Richie. I would take a bullet for the you man. Do? That song you sucks. You love Lionel Richie? Um, hello? Oh, that's awful, too. Is it me you're looking for? They, all his songs suck. He wrote, he wrote Lady. It sucks. What about dancing on Awful. the sea? That's a terrible oh, what a song. What a stupid thing to sing about. Oh my God, maybe Lionel Richie is terrible. He sucks. Oh no, but he's got a mustache. Yeah, but anyway, the mustache is great. November 30th, Thriller is released. Yeah. In just over a year, Thriller became and currently remains the world's best selling album of all time. Yeah. Uh, with estimated sales of 66 million copies. Wow. Seriously, though, best album ever. Yeah. Thriller, Billie Jean beat it. All on the PYT, want to be starting something? The girl is mine. That one sucks, but. Yeah. All those songs on one album. Michael yeah. Jackson changed the world with that. It's crazy. Album. Uh, December seventh, uh, during a television taping of WWF Championship Wrestling that aired on tape delay, Big John Studd mm-hmm. announced his body slam challenge, promising a payoff to anyone who can successfully slam him in the ring. Mm-hmm. Andre the Giant was the first WWF wrestler to successfully slam John Studd. Uh, dis- despite boasting that he'd never been or never could be properly slammed, Andre and later Hulk Hogan would slam him multiple occasions during the next four years. Bob Backlund slammed him. Tony Atlas slammed him. Roddy Piper slammed him. Blackjack Mulligan mm-hmm. slammed him. Haku also slammed. He was just a whore. Yeah, like right? he's just a, he everybody. was a big dude, but then he just kind of got washed up. And Andre the Giant hated Big John Stud okay. and beat the shit out of him. Okay. And December 11th is your date, right? No, December 13th is Oh, date. December 11th, Tony Basil's Mickey. Oh, yes. Mickey, you're so fine. You're so funny. Hey, Mickey. That's right. That is a remake of a song called Kitty by oh. Dudes. Oh, Kitty, you're so fine. You're so fine. You're from, oh, Kitty. Okay. Oh, Kitty. Just so you know. But that became, Mickey became number one. That girl was a real cheerleader, and she was like. Tony so, Basil? Tony Basil? Yeah. She's like a well known choreographer. Chore- yeah, choreographer. I did not know that That's about right. her. But anyway. That was what, the only hit she ever had, I think. No, it was all she had. Yeah, yeah. she did. But she but she went on to keep choreographing yeah, she does. tons of things. And she still does. I think she still does. Yeah. She's 175 right now, but she yes, still she does. She still does it. All right, December 13th. Mm hmm. Oh, the night you mean? Are you mean December thirteenth? The night the Smurfs Christmas special was on? Yes. Okay. What happened? 
um, the, the FBI surrounds Lewis in the reading room of the New York Public Library. What? So the FBI yes. set the scene, surrounded the New York Public Library. The reading they, room. They found Lewis because that librarian yeah, who tipped right. him. That's right. This is the same night that Square Pegs is on TV. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, a need for money forces the super cool Jennifer into donning a uniform, taking an unlikely and uncool job after school. Also, Cagney Lacey's on. So he was immediately arrested, taken into custody for questioning, and the following week his wife, Leanne, turned herself in. Well, Cagney Lacey's on. So during the interview... The Lewises deny having anything to do with the poisonings. And they're probably like, let us get back home to watch Cagney and Lacey. That's we right. have nothing to do with this. So he also denies ha- having written the extortion letter to Johnson & Johnson, even though his handwriting and a fingerprint on the letter was an exact match. Oh, he's delusional. So um, th- the Chicago officials disclosed that someone had sent another extortion letter to the White House threatening to bomb it and create more Tylenol deaths unless Ro- Ronald Reagan changed his tax policies. And yeah. Lewis was an accountant. He vehemently denied writing the second letter, even though his handwriting was a perfect match. And he was an accountant, so yeah. he knows all the tax, <laughs> tax policies. policies. Uh, Aside from the letters, investigators couldn't find any evidence leaking James Lewis or his wife to the Tylenol murders. Registration records produced by the police show that during the time the bottles were tampered with, the Lewises were living in a hotel in New York. Further evidence proved that Leanne Lewis was at her job daily in New York in New York. People living in a hotel are always up to no good. And witnesses claim that James Lewis was known to meet her every day for lunch and after work. Um, So the police weren't able to find any bus, train, or airline records indicating they had returned to Chicago during the time when the bottles were tampered with. No proof. So the mounting evidence ruled out the couple as being involved. So this is almost all the leads in the case have grown cold now at this time, by this time. Cold case files. Um, although Lewis was never convicted for crimes directly related to Tylenol, he was eventually found guilty of extortion and six unrelated counts of mail and credit card fraud. Mm. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison. He served only 13 years of his sentence before being released on parole in 1995. I wonder why he stopped if he was the Tylenol killer. Like, why he well, stopped? Well, he, he couldn't have been because they weren't in Chicago at the time. I think he just was a nut that wrote the letters. Oh. Following his arrest in December of 1982. Um, so they didn't do it. They, yeah, they were unable to find any new suspects. The um, So the team dwindles. It's working on it. Um, there's this roughly drawn criminal, criminal profile and partial fingerprints taken from some of the bottles, which remained unmatched. Um the tr- profile has been widely disputed throughout the investigation. Um, every clue in a case is vital when building a criminal profile because it reveals important characteristics of the killer. In a criminal case that lacks evidence and involves a random selection of victims, like the Tylenol murders, the chances of constructing an accurate profile is very difficult. I think Adville did it. It could be. That's that the is the story of the Tylenol poisons. So we, don't even, we still don't know. We still have no idea. So the last thing we did was December 13th, I think, with the yes. Smurfs. And the December, so we're almost done with the year. December 17th. Tootsie came out, the movie yep, Tootsie. That's right. Did you know? Did you remember that Bill Murray was in that? No. I clearly haven't seen that in a long time. Uh, but I noticed it. I looked up on this. Bill Murray agreed to admit his name from the opening credits to prevent audience expecting a Bill Murray movie along the illness, along the lines of Meatballs. Yes. Or Caddyshack. Stripes. He improved or he improvised most of his scenes. Oh. I guess he's like the actor or something. You know how yeah. you said Tootsie was he's an actor, actor. actor or whatever. Yeah. Bill Murray's like actually gets all oh, his roles. Oh, I do so remember that like, now. I don't remember it at all, but I watched a scene that was hilarious of him improvising. So now I want to watch that again because Bill Murray is great. And Dustin Hoffman made a very unattractive woman. Yeah, right. A very ugly woman. He did say that he Dustin Hoffman came to a bunch of realizations during that, that he, he saw how unattractive he was as a woman and he suddenly realized that he, throughout his life, completely ignored unattractive women his whole life and, and never talked to any of them and realized that he's probably missing out on some awesome conversations because he only talks to beautiful women. Yeah. Uh, but with this whole Me Too thing, he's been really called out on a lot of oh, he has. sexual harassment stuff. Yeah, I didn't too. hear that. So, and he's like getting angry at people. So, oh, he is? Yeah, I don't know if he's he's kind of like, who knows? Um, if that's anymore, we don't know about any of that. But uh, so Bill Murray rules. Yes. December 17th, also Dark Crystal came out. I remember that movie. Did you love that? Yeah, I did at the time. Jim Henson's plan with the film was to get back to the darkness of original Brothers Grimm fairy tales. He felt children liked the idea of being scared and that this was a healthy emotion for them to deal with. I agree. I never saw that. Steve Bishop always loved it. And yeah. I just was creeped out by the those female Muppets. Yeah, that, I know you're that talking weird about. weird scene or whatever. Yeah. I never saw it, but I just never had a desire to. Never wanted to. Really. Yep. And then December 18th. 1982, mm-hmm. Daryl Hall and John Oates, Maneater goes to number one of the she's Billboard charts. She's a Maneater. Oh, here, here she, she comes. comes. Watch out. Watch out, boy. She'll, she'll chew, chew you up. up. And John Oates also explained that this, it's also natural and assume this, this also, one this is, is about This is also about the music industry. This is not about a woman. Also, this is not about a woman. Not about the music industry, but it's about the city of New York oh. in the 80s. It's about greed, avarice, and a spoiled riches. Hall and Oates really think they're deep 
They they well just Oates. Oates is a deep Oates thinker. Oates thinks he's a deep thinker. Oates, Oates is Hall where, thinks everybody's ripped him off. Oates is worthy of the collage. Hall thinks all music is is based on on his crap. rich girl. Every single song is based on rich girl. Yeah, <clears throat> every single song. And December twenty fifth on Christmas. Yes. This is the last thing I have for 1982. Yes. Ric Flair retains oh his God. NWA world title against Kerry Von Erich in a cage match oh with God. fabulous freebird Michael Hayes as the guest referee. Ric Flair is such a weirdo. At WCCW's Christmas Star Wars card in Dallas, Texas, Hayes pulled Kerry on top of a day's flare following a mid-ring collision and made the three count, but Kerry refuses to win the title by cheating. The aftermath of the match which sees Hayes, fellow freebird cheating. Terry Gordy, slam the cage door on Kerry's head as Von Erich tries to leave the cage, sets off the Von Erichs versus Freebirds feud which rages across Texas for nearly five years. Don't tell me there's cheating in wrestling. It was just, Kerry Von Erich is just above that. He's like, mm-hmm. you know, you knocked Flair out and put me on top of him. I'm not going to win like that. Okay. That's not how I win. Yeah. Plus, Terry Gordy slammed my head in the cage. It's on. It was the yes. fabulous Freebirds who were, mm-hmm. they were like mullet-having guys who always had Confederate flags and played billiards. Yeah. Uh, fighting the Von Erichs who were brothers. A whole family of wrestling people. They all killed themselves. What? There was like seven of them. Their dad was Fritz von Erich and all these brothers. That all wrestled. A couple and they all probably had TBIs. Yeah, they all killed themselves. Yeah. I mean, they probably all have TBIs. They Look what did. happened to that Chris Benoit guy. Yeah, he killed his family. He yeah. killed his kids and his wife. And TBI. Killed himself. Yeah, TBI. And that's NFL, too. I well, don't know why you can be so pro NFL and wrestling. I'm not it's pro. I'm just... All those brain injuries. Entertainment. It's, it's, I know, but people are getting fucked up. I know. Well, what are they going to do? Not, what what not are they going to do if they don't play do flag that? football? Nobody's going to watch that. Why not? What are these people? If, okay, say we get rid of the NFL and wrestling tomorrow. What jobs are those guys going to have? Well, they're already fucked up. You might as well do keep going with the work? ones that are already fucked oh, up, but just don't Arby's? bring any new ones in. Oh. Something I don't we know. Solve it today. I don't know. I don't know. We got to get out of here, Chuck Berry. This has been 1982. Sorry, we failed. Yep. Sorry, folks. Get out of here, Chuck Berry. Get out of here, Chuck. Get Berry. out, Chuck. Chuck. Chuck Berry. Get out of here. Chuck Berry. Get out of here. Get Chuck out, Berry! Get out of here! Get out of here, Chuck Berry! Get out of here! What are you doing here, Chuck Berry? Get out of the bathroom! Chuck Berry's in the bathroom again! Get out of here, Chuck Berry! <laughs> <laughs>